message that Jesus has broken out, broken and spilled out for us is one that uh, can never grow old. It's something that we must always remember. Thank you, Benjamin, for sharing that. Rebecca, I'd like to invite you to come up, and we're going to just have a special prayer with you. Um, let's, let's go ahead and kneel up here. And Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for Rebecca's commitment to you today. And Lord, we just ask that you will witness in her life, that you will send your Holy Spirit to be on her and fill her, watch over and protect her, uh, keep her and direct her, guide her and lead her. Lord, you said when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And when we follow in your footsteps, son or daughter, uh, you look down and you say, this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. We thank you for the assurance that we find in Jesus. May this assurance be in Rebecca's heart all her days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Typically pray as well before we jump into the sermon, into God's word, and the uh, time is, is racing along on the clock, but uh, let's just ask the Lord to bless his word, because without, uh, without his blessing, we won't hear it and I won't speak it right, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, so let's, uh, let's ask him. Lord, we're thankful for your word, we're thankful that we can gather together in your house, thankful for what you're doing in our hearts, in our homes, our families, our children. Lord, we're asking for your blessing to be abundantly poured out on us. I pray for the ability to speak for you today and that you will help us to hear your words, words of life uh, coming to us, that we might walk close with you in the times in which we live. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Intimacy with God. Have you ever wanted to be close to God? Amen. I think that's why we're here today is because we would like to be close to God. It, uh, we've probably all had those days where it seemed like God was far away. But uh, we have the assurance through the word of God that Jesus was, came here to be with us. In fact, his name was Jesus to save us from our sins and Emmanuel, God with us. The scripture that we had this morning, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, this is from John, as he is speaking to those who he is writing his letter to, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. There it is. Our fellowship is with the Father. You think you're nobody? You know, people often try to figure out who's who in this world based on who they're connected to, right? In this world, when you're connected with the Father and the Son, you're somebody. Even if people in this world are like, nah, I don't get it. I don't accept him as my Father. I don't know about the Son. But when you and I accept him as our Father, and we accept the Son as our Savior and Redeemer, we have fellowship with them. And this is the creator of the universe, the creator of all that is. These things John is writing to them that their joy may be full. Now when you and I remember this, when we remember that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, I'm going to guess that we're happier on those days than on the days when we forget. Would I be accurate in that or is that just my story? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not alone. Yes, when we remember that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, we're, we're on a more joyful track on those days than on the days when we forget, when it seems like everything is all hopeless and alone. These verses remind us that we're not. So the Bible gives us some pointers and some tips on to maintaining our intimacy with God, our walk with God. In fact, it says in the Bible that Noah walked with God. It says that Enoch walked with God. They had an intimate connection to the Almighty. And we can as well. Jesus' disciples, when they were walking with him on this earth, who were they walking with? 
They were walking with God, weren't they? They were walking with God. When Jesus was on the earth, Steps to Christ, page 93 says, he taught his disciples how to pray. He directed them to present their daily needs before God and to cast all their care upon him. Their daily needs before God and to cast all their care upon him. Now when you and I do that, isn't the day better? The day is better when we do that. Going on in Steps to Christ are these words, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us but brings us up to God because when somebody's forgotten something in this relationship, it's not God. God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't forgotten me. When something goes wrong in this relationship, it's us who's forgotten something about God. The Bible says there's this little thing called sin, and it's not so little. And this... Sin stuff gets in the way of a intimate walk with God. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And then we have these words in the little book, Amazing, God's Amazing Grace, page 297. These are fascinating. The reason it is so difficult for men and women to live religious lives is because they do not exercise the mind unto godliness. It is trained to run in an opposite direction unless the mind is constantly exercised in obtaining spiritual knowledge and seeking to understand the mystery of godliness. It is incapable of appreciating eternal things. When the heart is divided, dwelling principally upon the things of the world and but little upon the things of God, there can be no special increase of spiritual strength. So when we're going along in life and we're like, I need some more spiritual strength, can we get it? Where do we go to get it? We go to God. We go to the Bible, but we go to God. We, we can go to the Bible and we can read the Bible all the way through, but if it doesn't breed assurance in our mind that God loves us and he's got a plan and a purpose and a future for us, to the point where when trouble comes, we remember that God is the one who helps us in our troubles and we get down on the floor, arms outstretched to the Almighty, crying out to God for help and intervention in our lives, then we've read the Bible in vain. You remember the little song when we were in Sabbath school. Read your Bible, pray every day, and we'll what? Grow grow, grow. Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and we shrink, shrink, shrink. You know, we could sing that song and we could all go home because that's the essence of the sermon, really. <laughs> but even here we need some help. Should the world prove a snare to us, our only remedy is to cry out to God for help. If we've been divided, if our interest and our, our focus has gotten onto the things of the world and so we come into a crisis and we feel ourselves all despairing of strength to meet it, the devil always has something. He's like, I got this for you. This will help you to meet it. And it's always the wrong thing. And it makes you feel worse than before. But when we come to God, we come to Him for help. So even here, we need God's help. If our heart has been divided away, we need God's help. It says in Psalms 94, 17, unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Next verse, verse 18, when I said my foot slips, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Psalms 94, 19, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. 
Now, here's the thing. We need to find comfort in thinking about God. The devil doesn't want us to find comfort in thinking about God. He just doesn't. He wants us to think that it's too far, that God is too far away. The separation is too dark. It's too deep. It cannot be connected. But David says, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. So when we turn from the things of the world, when we turn our focus from all that's going on out there, and we turn them to God and his thoughts towards us, we find comfort starts to build. In our world, there's suffering. You've probably had some. In our world, there's grief. From loss, you've probably had some of that too. And there is no comfort like the comfort of Jesus. There's five comforts of God that I'd like to bring your attention to this morning. There's more in the Bible. (laughs) But I'd like to, to bring our attention to five comforts of God that need to be internalized in our lives through prayer and study for a delightful walk with God. Do you want to hear them? All right, five comforts of God to internalize through prayer and study for a delightful walk with God. Number one, faith. Faith is a focus on the power of God. You see, when things are going bad, when things are greed, when things are angry, when things are upset, when things are stressed, usually in all of those situations, we're focused on anything and everything but the power of God in the moment. But every time in the Bible when one of God's mighty heroes met one of those obstacles, and we have this fantastic story in Scripture, it's because they turn from that moment to faith in God, faith in the power of God. They remembered that this is not the end. This is not where it all comes to a conclusion. This is where God can begin because he can take something that has nothing and he can make everything out of it because he is the creator. The devil has tried to strike a master stroke in our world with this concept of atheism, that there is no God. And if people want to believe in him, perhaps he's one that's far away who just started things and walked off. But the Bible doesn't want us to believe in a God like that. The Bible wants us to believe in a God that is near, nigh unto us. One that very much cares about us, loves us, acquainted with us and everything that goes on in our life. One we can turn to and cry to help and get it. Remember Pilgrim, he's walking through on his way to the celestial city in the book Pilgrim's Progress and he comes to a place called the Swamp of Despond. Now, if anybody's ever been in in Despond, you know why they likened it to a swamp. It's just hard to kind of climb out of that kind of a feeling on your own. When you're despairing of something, you know, someone can come along and give you an encouraging word and you're like, whatever, right? Because that's what despair does. Despair does not accept things. The only thing that can, you can really get out of the, despond, the, 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 the pond of despair is what Christian did, Pilgrim did, when he finally is wandering around and he's about to sink in this thing, what did he do? He said he cried out for help. And you know what the next thing that happened in Pilgrim's Progress? Help arrived. You know, there's another gentleman in the story named Help. You know who that, that man is in our story, right? Is Jesus. So when we're, when we're in this situation, if the situation were to come to us and we get stuck in it, we cry out for help and Jesus helps. I don't... The Bible doesn't specify things that we can't ask for help with. If we're grieving, we can ask for comfort. If we're hurt, we can ask for help with healing. If we're alone, we can ask for fellowship with the Father and the Son. Faith is a focus 
on the power of God. And it will comfort our hearts to think of his power rather than our position. David, Gideon, Daniel, Samuel, Joshua, all of these guys. You, you can think of their stories. You probably know them by heart. You could tell them to someone off the street. And if you can't, come see me so we can tell you the story because I'm not going to go in and tell the whole story now. But they all got into crisis situations and they found out that God was their ever-present help in trouble. 1 Peter 1.5 talks about people like this. Talks about people not just like them, but can be us too who internalize the comfort of faith. This is the description who are kept by the power of God through faith on to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, the faith that these guys had and the faith that's going to be revealed in the last time are going to look very, very similar. I don't think all the stories of God's power have been written yet. There's probably one coming up with your name attached to it because we're living in the last times. And the last times, according to the Bible, are not easy and we can look around us and we can listen to the rhetoric and we can see this, the, as it were, the coming events casting their shadows before them and we can realize we're in trouble and we need some help. We've got to internalize the comfort of God, internalize faith in His power, focus on the power of God. Number two, hope. Hope is a focus on a future with God. Now, I used to think about this when I was a kid. What is the future like without God? And I would imagine a dark room developing closet back when they used to have 35 millimeter film, and you could get that room pretty dark, and it would be like that for all eternity. You'd never wake up. It would just be go to sleep and that's it. Never wake up to another sunny morning. Never wake up to another bird song or the woodpecker pecking in the trees. Never wake up to the flowers blooming. I used to love the daffodils coming out. They just seemed to smile on creation around them in the spring. It would never happen again. But a future with God, I used to like to think about that too. What is that like when the sun never goes down? When there's no more pain, I mean, you just can't imagine this. No more pain, sorrow, suffering, crying. My grandparents had a picture on the wall which had the, the marriage supper of the lamb portrayed on it, and this thing went off into the distance. You couldn't see it into the picture, you know. It went all the way up, you know, the... 3D dynamics of the picture, this thing just went on and on. And eternity, and I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that, a table that you couldn't see the end of, with food that there'd never be the end of. And a God that cares for you for forever. We want to internalize the five comforts of God in prayer and study. Faith is a focus on the power of God. Hope is a focus on the future with God. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I used to think of this. I used to imagine God up there designing things you know they, they would like this you know they would like this this is what they would prefer you know this is this would match their personality this kind of place i used to think of it in that way and i'm gonna i'm not gonna say that that doesn't happen but what has occurred to me recently is that when god says i go to prepare a place for you he's talking to his disciples and he's going to prepare a place and he's walking up golgotha's hill in his mind He's walking the Via Della Rosa up to Calvary's climax. He's preparing a place. And when a person gives their life in a manner like that for you, it's hard for them to forget about you. 
It's hard for them to forget about me. When God's written your and my name on his hands through nails going right through the palms, it's hard for him to forget. He didn't do it so he could remember. His love is greater than what we can imagine and he went up Calvary's cross to prepare a place for us that we can live with him for eternity. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, born us again into a lively hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's fun to have that vibrating hope, isn't it? We know what it's like at times in our life, but God wants us to have it in our experience with him. And he's going to take us there. You know, we're, we're growing, but we're going to get to this place where this lively hope just kind of burns within us. Hope is a focus on a future with God. Number three of the five comforts of God that we want to internalize through prayer and study for a delightful walk with God is love. Love is a reminder of the mercy of God. I mean, there's so much. I mean, you can get into a great big study on here on this, but let's just go. Let's go go with this at the minimum. Love is a reminder of the mercy of God. Perhaps you remember the story of Rahab. Rahab has grown up in a culture and an environment where nothing good ever probably went right for her. I don't know the circumstances that can cause a person to get into the lifestyle that she eventually got into, but the Bible tells us that she became a prostitute. It was an unusual day for her when two men arrived at her door in a panic seeking for a place to be hidden. And she'd heard about these people and their God and something welled up within her. I need out of the situation that I'm in. I can't reside in this situation. I can't be like this anymore. She says, when your people come and they destroy this city of Jericho, could you remember me and my house? And they said, get everybody in your house into your home. Get them, get them all there and take this scarlet cord and throw it out the window. And when we come, we'll look at that scarlet cord. She took that scarlet cord, I'm sure, as they fled off, according to her, you know, she hid them and then sent them away as the soldiers came to look. And I'm sure she fingered this silver, this, this, this cord, and a new life and a new light started to develop in her as she started thinking what this could mean. A way out of this kind of lifestyle, a way out from a culture of violence, a way out from a culture of death, a way out from all of this. And as these soldiers started marching around the walls of Jericho in absolute silence, terrifying the rest of the entire vicinity and the rest of the soldiers on the wall, she's quietly putting out one foot after another of a scarlet cord out the window, remembering the mercy of God, the mercy that is going to be promised to her and the mercy and the love of God that comes to her through that deliverance changes her life. And she becomes one of the progenitors of the Messiah in the lineage of Christ. There's two men that the Bible talks about. They went up to the temple to pray. And the one man, he was a pretty good guy. He might have been the pastor. And he was praying, and the Bible says he was praying thus, with himself. Like apparently the prayer didn't go any further. And it went something like this. Dear Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like the other political party in town. I'm thankful that I have this world philosophic view and this ideology because it's so much better than 
theirs. And I thank you for all the possessions you've given me and the, the wealth and the riches, and I'm not like these poor guys, and I'm, and, uh, I'm not like the rich, really rich, super rich guys either. I'm, I'm just kind of good. Thank you, God, for making me good. And as prayer goes on, you can read it in the Bible, and then the focus shifts because I think Jesus is tired of telling the story of a guy about who's praying with himself. And he shifts over to this guy. He's a sinner. Now, a sinner is somebody who sins. They do things that aren't right. And he's off in the corner. He can't even lift his eyes to heaven. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that man went away justified. Well, the other man was just praying with himself. You know, a person doesn't have to think, you know, a person can say, well, I can't think of any bad sins that I've ever done. Maybe I, you know, I can't be that guy. God be merciful to me, a sinner, because I can't think of any sins. You know, we can all fit into the description of Laodicea in the Bible. If we're not hot or cold... We can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Right? But many can think of sins. Sins they'd rather have blotted out of their mind that would never come again, that darken the doorway of their soul. And they think that God cannot hear them because the devil tempts them with their despair. And God says, be merciful. He says, this man prays, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he goes away justified. Because what? God is merciful. And God is love. Love is a reminder of the mercy of God. Jude chapter 1 verse 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You want to keep yourself in the love of God? Look for the mercy of God. Remind yourself of the mercy of God. Remind yourself of the mercy of God. So of these five comforts, we've come down through faith, hope, and love. The Bible says that the greatest of these is love, but we're not done yet. It doesn't mean these are greater, but they're indispensable. We've got we to gotta internalize these two. Internalize the law. What? The law doesn't give me any comfort. But it does give you direction. You see, sometimes in life we're all astir because we don't know which direction to go. We don't know what decision to make. We have no idea what to do. But the Bible talks about God's law as a place of wisdom and understanding. We can come and get ideas of what His will is for our life. And we ask, what, what does God want me to do, right? We want to know the will of God. We've got to know His law in order to know the will of God. If we don't know His law we're, and we're asking for the will of God, He's going to say, you know, come read it. You know, here's my will. It's laid out. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is packed right in the, in the middle of this treatise on the law that David is writing in Psalms 119. It's all about the law through that chapter. Thy word, thy law is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It defines what is true and what is right. It divides truth from error. It guides us to stand with the oppressed rather than the oppressor. It sets the standard for equitable relationships. It provides conditions for the blessings of God. It points out our deficiencies and our failures and points us to Jesus. To take care of those. <laughs> we have, we're going to have to understand the law of God. We really are. Um, little confession. I, I stayed up last night listening to a sermon of Walter Weiss. And when I was done, I couldn't go to sleep. It was almost 12.30 before I could go to sleep. I mean, that was startling. Startling stuff I had listened to. Yeah, maybe you guys listened to this. It's on the, the treatise of, what is it, Fratelli Tutti? Brothers All, this treatise that has been put out, uh, encyclical, from the present Pope. 
I tell you what, when you get done listening to that, that presentation by him, you're going to want to understand why, and you're going to understand why God's law is a comfort. <laughs> and you're going, to want, you're going to want God's law internalized. You're going to want that faith, hope, and love internalized. You're going to want God's law internalized. It's going to bring comfort to your soul. Because what the influential people in this world are, are planning or maybe wishing for or desiring are not according to God's law necessarily. And when the push comes to shove, we want to be where? With God. We want to be with God. The last thing here, the number five, is judgment. We want to, judgment, are you kidding me? You want us to internalize judgment? What is the judgment of God in the Bible? It is delivering the oppressed from the oppressor, right? And when you find yourself in an oppressive situation, you want the judgment of God, and we want it now, right? We want some deliverance, and that's what judgment's about. Now, if we find ourselves part of the ones doing the oppressing, then we might want the judgment to just hang off a little bit. Because when God comes to deliver, guess what? He delivers. And the ones doing the oppressing, they really, 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 really wish they hadn't done that. Judgment in the Bible is a deliverance of God from the oppressor. Jeremiah 22.3 says, Thus says the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. Sometimes a person can get down in this pool of despond we were talking about earlier, and I think maybe Isaiah was, because you're running along through Isaiah and you reach Isaiah 49, and it seems like it's an encouragement to someone who's been walking with God, and they're like, God, but I don't see any results. I've been praying for this person for forever. I don't see a chink in their armor. I don't see anything that they're loving you. I've been trying to witness to this person, nothing's happening. I've put out so many tracks and I've got no response. I've tried to tell people about the love of God. I've tried to live your love to others and it seems like it's getting poured out of cold, onto cold, hard stone. And Isaiah 49 talks about the judgment of God and he reminds those who are the target of Isaiah 49, it's all going to be okay. I'm not going to tell you what Isaiah 49 says. It's a secret. Now I know what you'll do this afternoon. You're going to go read it. You'll be encouraged by it. Is that okay with you? Judgment of God encourages people. But then we sometimes think, but, but Pastor, wait, wait, wait. I, I heard of some judgments in the Bible, and I don't know that these guys were... Or oppressing anybody. You know, I, Aaron's sons, they were just out there in the, uh, in the temple, you know, doing the wrong thing, but the fire came out and licked them right up. That's kind of scary, because what if I just make a little mistake and I just get licked right up by the fire of God? I'm not so sure this judgment thing is a comfort. And didn't I... Didn't I hear about Uzzah? Uzzah reached out. He was just trying to steady the ark, Pastor. He had just, just put his hand out so the ark wouldn't fall. <laughs> Boom! The man's dead. I'm afraid, Pastor, that if I do something just a little bit off, I might get smitten by God in mid-act. How can you tell me that judgment's a comfort? And there's some other cases in the Bible, too. I'd like to suggest to you in these situations that these individuals, sometimes leaders, these individuals were leaders, and I think you'll notice that sometimes God deals with leaders a little differently than he deals with the everyday person. Sometimes leaders appear to receive judgments from God not directly related to oppressing others. 
such as Uzzah and Aaron's sons. But these individuals were on a path in their own hearts that was depriving others of the blessing that comes from walking in the way of the Lord. There's something about faithfulness to God that God blesses. And sometimes individuals, sometimes leaders, they start walking in a way that doesn't go in the way of the Lord. And God has to deal with it even if nobody else knows about it. And so sometimes we find these stories in the Bible because these people, unbeknownst to everyone else around them, we see it illustrated in the story of... of uh, um, Oh, you know the, the, the story of the man that got stoned in Joshua's day. Nobody knew what was going on with that gold, that wedge that was hidden in his tent. But the blessing of God was deprived from the rest of the people because of this going on in this guy's tent. And the blessing did not return until this was taken care of. And so you'll see times where people can be receiving oppression. They don't even know it, but it could be one of these situations that God is working on. But even these we can take comfort in because God is wanting His blessing to be poured out. He's wanting nobody to be oppressed. He knows that if people are separated from Him, the result is going to be oppression. And these individuals, as a Aaron's sons, they were on a track that was going to separate people from their God. And where does the blessing come from? Emmanuel, God with us. Intimacy with God. Togetherness, communication, communion with God. The Bible says this in Psalms 119, verse 1 and 2, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. Circumstances, temptations will challenge your walk with God, but we must keep our mind on Him. Fill our minds with these five comforts of God. 1 Peter 1 6 says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now let me just pause here because someone might have taken some of the things I just said about sin and leadership that there might not be some hope there. How many leaders do you know from the Bible when they cried out to God for help? God helped them. Right? You can, we wouldn't have given them grace, I'm telling you. We would not have. They would have been bringing up the firing squad and you and I would have said, it's just. It's the right thing to do. I mean, if you think of Manasseh, Manasseh caused more blood to be shed in Jerusalem than anybody before him. Can you imagine? The streets were running with blood. They, they say that it's not recorded in the Bible, but tradition says that, that Isaiah was sawn in two by Manasseh. Put him in a tree, cut the log in half. And the people were dying and he was offering up babies on the altars to burn them. And he was, it was horrible. God says it's got to stop. So he sent, the, he sent the enemy along and they come and took him captive. And while he's away captive, guess what he does? He gets to thinking. And he decides, I'm going to ask God for forgiveness. And he does. And God hears his prayer. And guess what God did with him? Restored him to being king again. What in the world? He started thinking about faith, hope, love, God's law, God's judgment. He realized that in his own heart there was something oppressing him that he had only God could get rid of. 
And he asked, asked God for deliverance from that thing, and he was delivered. I believe we'll see Manasseh in heaven. Isaiah will be like, man, the last time I saw you, you were running the chainsaw here. Praise the Lord you're here. Can we be neighbors? Because <laughs> that's what heaven is like. We realize that our sin has separated us from our God, but our God has not left us separated and he wants to walk with us and have an intimate relationship with us. And he sent Jesus to die for our sins and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved, even Manasseh. Even us. Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falls seven times and rises up again. What's the biblical number for completion and perfection? So this person has fallen completely, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sounds like a Manasseh type, maybe. Or could be us. He rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You see, the wicked stay wicked. They don't actually get up and look to Jesus. They don't actually get up and say, there's a, there's a Redeemer, there's a Savior. They don't get up and say, I need the blood of the Lamb to deliver me from my sin and to cover me with His robe of righteousness. They don't actually get up to do that. They just stay wicked. So when we fall, where do we go? Jesus. What about when others fall? When people are falling now in our world, right? And let, let's say someone's political foe is caught in the act of something. Isn't there all kinds of rejoicing by some people? The Bible says, Proverbs 24, 17, Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. God is such a good God. He weeps when people fall and he's trying to pick them up. We want to be working with him on that project. I don't know, but I, I, I just hope and pray that somewhere in something in this message was able to give light to somebody that might have had the shade cast over them this week. And I hope that there's some sort of encouragement and some assurance here for somebody here today on that. And I believe you'll be further encouraged. You know who you are when we sing our closing hymn, number 515, The Lord is my light. Just take that. Just grab onto that and say, God, I want you. I'm not going to let you go. I need your blessing. I need you to guide and direct my path. As you sing this song, take it into your heart as a prayer and a commitment all at the same time and an assurance of God's care for you.